Rigging is tricky. That is especially true when it comes to rigging models that are representing ships from the World War II era or earlier. And that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, for some unknown reason, model kit manufacturers don't provide good information on how to rig the ship. They provide you a painting guide like this, which represents some of the rigging on the ship, and they only give you effectively one angle. Yes, I know, they are depicting the rigging from the port and starboard side of the ship, but in reality, for the rigging, that's just a mirror image, so it's the same thing. There's no point in showing it from both the port and starboard side of the ship. What you really need is to have another angle. For example, it wouldn't be nice if they just showed the masts and they took out all the other superstructure details around it and gave a front-on view or a stern view of the rigging. Or even better still, why can't they do an isometric projection? An isometric projection is just a 3D drawing, like you find pretty much everywhere else in the manual. So it's not like they don't have the capability to do that. And you might think that, well, maybe they don't have the information on the rigging, but clearly they have some information on the rigging because they do put at least limited information in the painting guide. And they clearly do have good access to archives because they have been able to reproduce every other part of the kit in a reasonable level of detail. So I don't know what it is that makes them not put the details of the rigging into the guides, but I find that very frustrating. So it is because of that lack of information that you are forced to look elsewhere to try and fill in the gaps. So in my case, what tends to happen is I'll go online and I'll start trying to find images of these ships. Generally, you can find two classes of images. You'll find drawings and historical photos. When it comes to the drawings, they often don't depict the rigging on them at all, so they're generally not helpful. And the ones that do show the rigging, well, you don't know who drew them, so you can't really be certain of their accuracy. You would think then that the best source would be to look at historical photos. The problem is historical photos of these ships were taken at a time when cameras weren't that good. So you'll have low resolution photos with low dynamic range, and guess what you need for rigging? need high resolution and good dynamic range to be able to pick it out. So for most of the time with photos, you can't see the rigging. So that's not helpful either. But on occasion, you can pick out a little bit of a detail here and there. So what I would do in the past is I'd take all that information, I'd combine it together with the aim being to come up with a design that would be better than nothing. And if you've looked at a model ship without rigging, it does look odd. So it doesn't take a lot to put some rigging on that is better than nothing. So that's how I started with these ships, and it continued like that for many years. And then in 2015, something happened. Wargaming released World of Warships. World of Warships is a naval combat game focused on the World War I and World War II era. When World of Warships was released, I didn't think of it in terms of model building. I just played the game because, well, I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to anybody, but I'm interested in ships. Anyways. After a few years, the number of ship models represented in the game really started to grow quite extensively. And it got to the point where I was building a ship, I don't remember exactly which ship it was, but I realized, hey, the ship that I'm building already exists in World of Warships. And there's a 3D model in that game that shows the rigging. I should have a look at that. 3D model is great. I can go and view the ship from any angle, can scroll up and down and get a really good idea of how to do the rigging. And it gets even better because the World of Warships developers attempt to recreate the ship in-game as accurately as possible using information found in the National Archives of the countries that built the ships. They have teams of people that go to the archives and do proper research such that they can recreate that ship. So in a way, it might sound strange, but you probably find that one of the best references, or at least one of the best easily available visual references for a ship are the models that you can find in computer games and probably the most accurate representation that you can find for free from the comfort of your home. And so after that realization, I often find myself going into all the warships to look at their ship models so that I can get information on how to do the rigging or if there's a part of the manual that is especially unclear with how you should construct something then I can also go into all the warships to get a better understanding of how the part should look to assist with its assembly. 
although the ship models in World of Warships are very good, the mechanism by which you can view them is quite limited. You're limited to the port view, which gives you very limited camera angles and makes it difficult for you to zoom in on specific parts that you want to look at. In what I think is a somewhat gray area, you can find websites online that take the 3D models out of games and put them into viewers, and those viewers then provide you with sufficient controls to be able to view the model from any angle. Now, because I'm unsure of the status of these websites, and because I suspect that this is copyrighted content that I do not have rights to, I will not be showing you these models or referring to them anything other than that. I'll just simply say that if you search for them online, you'll probably find a 3D model. And if you can't, well, World of Warships is free to play. You can download the game, open the port, and there are mods that make the entire tech tree is available to you so you can view everything in port, even without having to play a single battle. How you access these models, or if you use them at all, is entirely up to you. My personal opinion is that these models are a good, quick and easy reference point that will get you 90% of the way to what you want. So you might as well use them to make your life easy. So that is the first part about why rigging is tricky, the lack of information on rigging. Although it's now better because of games like World of Warships. The other tricky part of rigging is actually rigging the ship. And that's what this video will be focused on. In this video, you'll see me make many mistakes, knock things off using the wrong types of glue, gluing things together, breaking things, and then fixing things. That is just the nature of rigging. So let's get started. As you can see, these masts are very bendy, they're not strong at all, so I'll need to take that in consideration, otherwise I'll have masts that bend towards the centre of the ship as soon as I install the rigging between them. To counteract that, I will install rigging that pulls them away from the centre of the ship, so that when I finish the rigging between the two masts, I'll pull them straight again. I'm going to start with the forward mast. Rigging can be tricky, and it comes down to the type of glue that you're using. Easy line is going to make your life a lot easier, but if the glue that you're using is stale or the wrong type of glue, it's not going to bond so well. The next thing to consider when installing the rigging is you need to know the order in which you're going to install the lines. Obviously, you don't want to obstruct yourself, so start with the lines that are innermost and work outwards. For the forward mast, I start by installing the lines that run from where the yard arm, or at least I think it's a yard arm, intersects with the mast and I run that line down to the points on the starfish platform. At this point, I'm applying minimal tension to the lines. I just want it to be tight enough for them to be straight. When I pull this mast forward and bend it away from the center of the ship, these lines might go slack. I don't want to put any additional tension on these lines at this point. Another important consideration is the glue that you are using. I started off using extra thick super glue. But unfortunately, this glue has become quite stale and it's not sticking as well as it usually does. And while this is working at the moment, it will become a problem and I'll switch to a medium viscosity glue that's a bit newer than this extra thick super glue. If you find that the glue is not bonding quickly with the easy line, change the glue. It should bond pretty much instantly as you touch it to the mast. You want a super glue that's going to bond pretty much instantly with the easy line. Because holding the easy line still on these very delicate parts is quite difficult. So you want to avoid that as much as possible because that's the time when you start knocking parts off of the ship. For example, this easy line that I'm installing right now. I'm intentionally doing the line that runs forward onto the walkway last because when this mast is returned to its erect position, I want the lines to all be under the correct tension. I'm pulling quite hard on this easy line to bend the mast forward a little bit. Now that the glue has dried on the connection points between the easy line and the starfish platform, I can cut off the excess with clippers. And then move on to installing the lines that go to the upper yard arm. The exact same process is followed again. At this point, I've switched to a medium viscosity super glue, so as you can see, I'm able to move a lot more quickly. All that I do is take the easy line, dip the end in the super glue, and then attach the super glue to the mast. Initially, it is very delicate. So if necessary, I come back and reinforce the connection point with more superglue. Once again, minimal tension is applied. If I pull too hard, then it'll cause the other easy line to slacken. That is definitely something that I do not want. Of course, you need to match the tension on the other side of the ship. Otherwise, your mast will go crooked. If you do put too much tension on the line, you'll either have to reseat the line or put 
equal tension to the corresponding line on the other side of the ship. Having very light tension on the lines is also a bit of a safety feature. It means that if you do touch those lines for whatever reason, there's a lot of bending that they can do. So you won't have to worry about accidentally snapping the mast or pulling the lines off. There's absolutely no reason to put a lot of tension on the line. When installing rigging, it's definitely worthwhile to use Easy Line or an equivalent product. Its ability to stretch is what makes all the difference. And just because it can stretch a lot, doesn't mean you need to stretch it a lot. All you want to do is put enough tension on it to pull it straight. You don't want to put any more tension on it because then it'll start bending the mast out of position. Of course, the more lines that you rig between two points, the more tension will be applied to it and it will start to bend the masts. If it gets to the point where the masts are bending and there is a lot of tension on the easy line, more than I think is reasonable, in those cases I will switch to embroidery thread and use it as an anchor to force the mast into its correct position because of course embroidery thread will not stretch at all. Now for the upper line that runs forward to the walkway. Since the lines that connect the two masts together are connected to the bottom yard arm, you don't need to put a lot of tension on this upper line. It will not be providing any structural support. It just needs to look good. So minimal tension is all that is required. All the heavy lifting is being done by the lower line that runs forward and connects to the walkway. I'm going to move back to the port side of the ship to get a better angle to feed the easy line through the railing so I can grip and hold it in place to apply the glue. After a short period of drying, the excess line can be clipped off of the starfish platform. Another tip when doing rigging is do not wear sleeves. I find it quite dangerous to wear sleeves when handling one of these ships from above. Of course, you can't feel the cloth on the sleeve. So it's a recipe for getting yourself hooked up on a mast and pulling something off the ship. So make sure that you use short sleeves when doing work like this. Otherwise, you'll probably damage something unless you are very careful and very aware of where you're putting your hands. I'm now installing the lines that run from the yard arm down to the flag deck. These are the lines which flag would be flown from. The process is exactly the same as before. I tip one end of the line in medium viscosity super glue and then I attach it to the yard arm. For these yard arms, there are indicators of where the lines should be attached, so that does make it a little bit easier. So just attach it to the little eyes and you are good to go. I find it easier to attach these lines to the top of the mast first and then wrap it around the railing later. You'll be able to pull it through the railing and upwards such that you make good contact. So it'll be much easier to put it under tension and glue it from the bottom than it would be to hold it under tension and try and attach it to these little eyes. But for now, all that needs to be done is they need to be attached to the mast and then kept in order. At this point, the trick is to just not tangle up the lines. After a short period, the glue that attaches the line to the yard arm has dried and it can be pulled taut and attached to the flag deck. Once again, I start inwards and work outwards. The two inner lines on each side of the yard arm need to be attached to the signal locker, which is also the innermost attachment point on the flag deck. So that's convenient. To try and maintain some order with these cables, all the ones that I'm not using, I flip over onto the other side of the ship this way I can reduce the chances of confusing myself and installing the wrong wire in the wrong place. There isn't a railing to wrap these lines around, so I'll just pull them taut and hold them on the flag locker for a few seconds so that they can bond. After selecting the next line, I run it through the railing in the correct position, very lightly pull it tight and use extra than super glue to bond it in place. I do quite like to have very long sections of wire so that it's easy to handle them. I know this is wasteful, but it's so much easier to have a good grip on the line than to have a very short and efficient line that you have to try and grip with tweezers. Fortunately, a little bit of easy line goes a long way, and I was able to rig nine ships with one spool of easy line. There is an additional line that runs from the stays at the end of the starfish platform, and that is the last wire that needs to be connected up on this level on the side of the ship. When pulling the wires, you do need to be careful. They will get hooked on all the little details. You obviously do not want to pull off a gun or damage them. These parts are all very delicate. The majority of the effort of rigging seems to go into making sure that you don't break the ship in some way. 
These wires that run from the end of the boom don't go down to the flag deck, they go down to a level lower. These walkways that connect the wings on which the anti-aircraft guns are located. It's installed in a similar fashion to the ones on the flag deck. The cable is wrapped around the walkway's railing and secured in place with medium viscosity superglue. For the forward mast, there's one final set of lines that need to be installed. These run from the top yard arm down to the railing on the flag deck, just forward of the forward funnel. At this point, you can see that there is a very slight curve on this mast forward. That will be corrected at the very end when this mast, which I believe is called the forward mast, is attached to that little mast at the back, which I believe is actually the main mast. It is quite fortunate that the lines between the two masts don't connect to the very top yard arm. That would be very delicate. And in both cases, they connect to the yard arms at the lower position, where the masts are a lot stronger. Having a bit of a trouble getting in there to grip this wire. Another example of why you should start in the middle and work outwards. In this case, because I've installed some of the cables on the outside already, I'm obstructing myself from accessing this cable. And I've made my life a little bit more difficult with its installation. Nevertheless, I get the job done. Getting the cable through from the other side of the ship is a little bit easier, thanks to a different angle that I can come in from, since the superstructure is not blocking my way as badly. Anyways, moving on to the main mast. First, as before, I will start by installing the lines in the middle of the ship. This line needs to run to the ring around the aft funnel. I'll try to wrap this line around that photo etch ring in much the same way that I do for the railings. But before I do that, I need to let the glue dry a bit, so I'll install some more line on the mast while I wait. There are considerably fewer lines on this mast, so that should make things go a little bit more quickly. I also, at this time, make the first attachments for the lines that run from the crane connection points to the end of the boom, and from the boat deck up to the end of that boom. Since the superglue does not dry instantly, you need to take into consideration the orientation of the cable, in this case, the cables run vertically upwards, or mostly vertically upwards, which means I want the connection point on the mast, or the crane block, to be angled upwards. To make sure the glue dries with the wire in that orientation, I lift up the easy line and I wrap it over the yard arm at the top of the mast. If I did not do this, the easy line would come out horizontal or facing down, and that would place a kink in the wire when you pulled it tightly to make the connection to the yard arm or the boom. I just need to clear a little bit of space on the boat deck so I can apply the glue. I apply the glue to the boat deck first by putting a little bit of a drop down and then I just insert the wire into it. And once again, I lay the wire over the top of the yard arm. Once again, it looks like a bit of a rat's nest and the challenge at this point is just to make sure that the lines don't get tangled with each other. I'm now battling to get this line around that wire and eventually I get it through from below but I don't want it to go through below, I want to go through above so I pull it out to try again with a bit of persistence so I'm able to get it through after which I pull it tight and apply super glue to bond it in place. Next I'll run this wire to the top of the mast. At this point this is easy line but I do change this because at this point I had not realized that this mast actually needs to be pulled forward a little bit because it's not standing vertically. I was still under the incorrect impression at this point that this mast would have connections from the top yard arm all the way across to the forward mast. It in fact does not, therefore this mast will need to stand up on its own without any tension between the two masts. This line will later be removed and replaced with embroidery thread to pull it vertical. From this angle it doesn't look too bad, but it really is quite badly out of alignment at this point. So. It's not something I would be able to tolerate. It would bug me. The majority of my effort here is going into making this connection point in the center of the mast, which is obviously difficult because there isn't an edge for me to easily wrap the line over. Whereas that would have been the case if I did it the other way around. I could have just wrapped it over the edge of the platform at the base. And now for two short lines that run from the cranes to the end of this boom.
and then for the lines that run from the boat deck to the boom. In this case, unfortunately, I cut the line too short, and as you can see, and I have to go through the additional trouble of trying to connect a line that is too short. And as you can see, it's already more difficult. So to assist it with bonding more quickly, I bring out the super glue accelerator. From the top yard arm of the main mast, there are a handful of lines that run down to the top of the, well, it's a starfish platform, I suppose, but it's a, a pretty basic starfish platform. Sometimes you find a line that's just going to be tricky, and it's unfortunate. The installation of these lines from the yard arm to the top of the platform is exactly the same as it was for the front platform. They're just shorter and there are fewer of them, so it's a little bit easier. I attach them to the eye on the yard arms, I then wrap them around the platform, pull them tight, and then apply a little bit of medium viscosity super glue to glue them in place. There are two lines that run from the yard arm to the platform with the search and signal lights. There should be two small platforms that extend from the front of this platform, however that detail was not included in the model. So instead of attaching the lines to the platforms, which are non-existent, I will wrap them around the railing. Since it is impossible to get the clippers into such a small space, I'll use my hobby knife to cut those lines. I gently pull it under tension and rub the blade against it until it eventually snaps. And now for some final wires that run from the structure that sits just forward of the third turret, they connect to the base of the platform and the yard arm. From this angle you can see that the top section of the main mast is angled slightly backwards. At this point I was still under the impression that the yard arm would be used to connect the two masts together, but that is not correct. And it is at that point that I realized that I need to straighten that top section of the main mast before I attach the two masts together with the horizontal lines. So the first thing to do is to remove the easy line and reach for embroidery thread. Embroidery thread will not stretch, and that is going to make this process a lot more tricky because it needs to be perfect. You need to get the line to the correct length such that the mast is standing vertically, and because it doesn't stretch, there is no room for error. Because of this, there is a lot of backwards and forwards before I finally get it into a position that I am happy with. Now that the main mast is in an acceptable state, I can install the lines that run between the two masts. The connection point of the main mast is actually very strong. That's quite nice because it means I can put as much tension as I like on the base of that mast to pull the forward mast into a vertical position. It will come as no surprise to you that once again I start with the two innermost lines. For obvious reasons, they'll become less accessible when the outer lines are installed. The first two lines that I put on need to be pulled the tightest. And the reason for this is that all subsequent lines that get put on will add a little bit of tension and pull the mast slightly together. In that process, you don't want to slacken the lines that you have already installed. So if the first lines that you install are the tightest, then any subsequent lines, even when pulling the mast a little bit more towards the center of the ship, won't pull it forward enough to loosen the tighter most inner lines. One of these lines from the yard arm to the platform wasn't stuck on very well and during this process I knocked it off. Fortunately this is still not too difficult to correct. I'm working upwards again and the connection point is very small so it is a bit more challenged than the initial installation, but these are the kind of things that you will have to deal with when you're doing rigging. I probably should have reinforced these connection points with some super glue after I originally installed them, but I was trying to keep the use of super glue to a minimum. I'm still not completely happy with how the main mast is standing, so I'm going to cut off that embroidery thread and do it again. I want it to be perfectly straight. I don't like that it's a little bit curved. It doesn't actually stand up straight. It has a curve in it, which I don't like. And it's during this process of fiddling that I then break the boom that runs off of the aft of the ship, which is a bit frustrating. This is one of the consequences of rigging. You do break off these more delicate pieces, and that's just the way it goes. Fortunately, the rigging on that aft boom is not very tight, which means I am able to reconnect it without having to remove that easy line. A minor hiccup, but something that was fortunately quite easy to resolve. Sorry about the poor focus and camera angle for this part of the installation. 
I was quite preoccupied at this point and I was not paying adequate attention to the cameras. After a little bit of effort I do manage to get the boom reattached. I can now continue with installing the lines that run between the forward and main masts. In total I'll be installing three lines on each side. Of all the lines to install these are the simplest and the last, which is quite a nice way to end the installation of the rigging. After installing all of the rigging, the super glue needs to be matted down. At the same time, I also mat down the super glue that I used when I installed all of the boat stands. This is Tamiya XF86, and I'll be using it to spray the entire ship just to make any bits of super glue, which are quite glossy, matte. This will conceal its appearance in the ship. During this process, I did notice that some of the lines on this forward mast are a bit loose. When the mast got pulled back into the upright position, there was not enough tension on them to pull them tight, so I'll reattach them so that they are nice and straight again. After applying that super glue, once again, I need to continue with the spraying of the matte coat. Don't want any shiny super glue to be visible on the ship. With the application of the matte coat, we come to the end of the video. The ship is now technically complete. It's just the aircraft that need to be constructed and installed. In the next video, I'll build and install one of the aircraft. I'm not sure if it'll be the RO43 or RE2000. But that is all that is left for this ship, to build and install two small aircraft. And of course, just a reminder to any viewers who aren't subscribed, please subscribe if you like these videos or if you want to encourage me to continue making videos like this. By subscribing, you help promote the channel on YouTube, which encourages me to create more and better videos. Thanks for watching. Cheers.